Being a hacker does not say what side you're on. Being a hacker means you know how things actually work and can manipulate the way things actually work for good or for harm. When you think of hackers, forget the criminal aspect of it. Yes, that exists, and yes, it's out there, but people in this community who call themselves hackers are incredibly talented people who are independent thinkers who come up with incredibly creative and innovative ways of solving problems um, that other people just don't think of solving in a certain way. You know, we, we are an incredibly creative bunch. We're an incredibly intuitive bunch. We latch onto technology and find new ways of using it and have been doing this, you know, for 50 years. A hacker is someone who wants to know how things work, take them apart, look at the components, see if there's a way to make them better, and put it back together and share that information openly without motivation of profit or fame or anything like that. To me, hacking is just trying to do things in different ways, making stuff do things it wasn't meant to do. Well, I mean, also, if you look back before there was technology, you know, if there was basic chemistry or anything like that, like alchemists, you know, at one point, that yeah. was pretty much considered a hacker. Um, you know, somebody that basically they're trying to figure out a way to do something that they're like, this, there's no possible way this should work, let's see if we can do it, and then let's spend 300 years trying it, you know, that's pretty much what... <laughs> the hackers saved the guys on Apollo 13 when you know, they had to hack together all that stuff to try to figure out how to save those guys and get them back. I mean, they were engineers, but they changed their job hats to hacker. Inventors or hackers? Michelangelo, I mean, that guy, he hacked everything. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci was a hacker. Alexander Dunbell. My brothers were hackers. They Somebody took a hunk of rock and made a wheel out of it. Yeah. They hacked at that rock right, until exactly. it became a wheel. Literally and figuratively. Thomas Edison, a uh, really good example of, uh, you know, a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. That's exactly why hacking is frustrating and it's exactly what kind of a person it is that does the job. Yeah. Without hackers, you've got no light bulbs. For any individual item, for any individual, you know, chemical or building or material, anything that is a raw material that can be forged into a product, there is the expected uses of it and then there's other. Most people look at the expected uses. They see a fork and they go, aha, this is an object that has one purpose, to eat food. And a hacker looks at the fork and says, aha, this is metal, it will conduct electricity. Aha, this has sharp points, it can make holes in clay for, you know, uh, making a sculpture. This world is not one where uh, hard drives naturally get smaller and printers naturally get better and cars naturally get, I mean, that's some guy, some gal, banging their head, for two years to figure out how do I take what we have right now and do it a little better. There would be no technology without hackers. Do you have a bank account? Do you, do you conduct transactions online? Do you have personal information, maybe health information you'd like to see secure and people not have access to? You know, every time you see your antivirus window pop up or you see that little key icon in the bottom of your browser, that's because a hacker made that happen for you. Some hacker somewhere wrote software that's keeping viruses off your computer, that's letting you buy things from Amazon, letting you pay your bills, that's letting you use the internet without having it completely overrun by the very, very small percentage of people that use hacker tools to do bad things. We are very academic, even those of us who are not scholarly, in the sense that we believe strongly in publicly sharing what we find. We are very teacher-oriented in, in that we want people to actually dive in, get their hands on something, and become a part, not just be on the sideline. And we're almost, you know, jazz musicians in the sense that we play off one another's energy and creativity and with enough people coming together, you can create something you had no idea. You, you started down one path and you wound up all the way over here, but all of a sudden you're just happy about it. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we made this too. 
basically this is uh, Grey Frequency's uh, skirt and she had asked me to uh, add some blinky lights to it and I had wired it all up and uh, using a microcontroller that uh, Lost had given me uh, just use that to drive all the blinking uh, I had asked him just to help me with some code to uh, to make everything blink and a little more random and he turns around and <laughs> completely rebuilds the thing and um, one person came to one person to another person for a tiny bit of help and suddenly more people joined in and the project became better and bigger than they thought it it, it, it was random it was it was not um, planned and it ends up being a wonderful experience just a community coming together Diverse. Very oh, diverse. Yeah. yeah, I see Linux, Mac, PC. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was referring to people there. <laughs> the diversity in the hacking community is is really really interesting. Um, it's kind of a, a smaller picture of the same type of diversity you get from the internet. The community is a lot of people. It's not just the hackers. It's not just law enforcement. It's not just government. It's the private sector. It's individual users. ISPs, software manufacturers, companies that have websites, people that hang out on MySpace, people like to read email, everybody's in this community. It's a very small community. Um, I'm amazed at how many people I, I, I knew online and you know, I've never met them in person. Um, this is my first time meeting them here at Def Con and Blackie. This is like, what, 8,000 people here maybe, 7,000, something like that. That's like not a big community, you know? But it's cool because you end up getting to know almost everybody you see. Like, I can't walk the halls and go, hey man, what's going on, or this or that, even though there's a lot of people here, quote. You know, you end up mat meshing with people you know, this or that that you've seen at another, you know, conference. And you just, you just vibe, you know? Many people have asked for the longest time how we can be so open and accepting. I think you can't divorce the fact that you're meeting people often without seeing them face to face for the first time. Right. You're meeting people without their skin color or their gender or their size or attractiveness being in the equation. Uh, because those barriers are gone, you end up making relationships with people you normally wouldn't otherwise and uh, end up fostering those uh, relationships over time. made it cool uh, originally was the obscurity of it it used to be it was it was a very very small close-knit community and it was people who were only interested in, in you know learning and, and discovering all sorts of things about phone systems computer systems all that a at this point now it's you know it's become very juvenile to an extent what's happened with the hacking community is the same kind of thing that happened with Lollapalooza it's, as it grew it got more publicized it got more mainstream and as it goes into the mainstream it loses that essence of what made it unique what made it cool people complain that it's not like it used to be it's not all in the underground it's not all secret and well the people in the underground are still in the underground they're there if you want to work that hard and you, you know you really want to earn that kind of credential then you want to be called that then you can still do that but what's going on in public what's going on here and now is something that wasn't even possible or, or realistic um, when in the day in the in the old days it's changed a lot over the years this community got going probably back in the 70s even long before the internet was a popular term and uh, grew through the 80s as uh, as more people became connected through dial-up BBSs and then as the internet came of age in the 90s it really began to explode for the longest time it was academic people who were understood computer science and liked to learn more about the way computers work and over time though as more and more information became available and the net grew and networking, uh, internet access became basically free, computers became free, operating systems became free, long distance telco charges became basically free, all the, a lot of the original motivations went away. Um, and as that happened, that changed the group dynamic. The culture was good, it was strong, it was, uh, it was good and it's just different now. So now there's multi-tiers. There's, there's a group of people who've been doing it for many, many years, um, and they're st still interested in learning and, and discovering and, and, you know, just testing out the quality of systems. And then there's a lot of real idiots who just, they come, they, uh, they come to something like this because they, they think they're going to be taught how to break into their bank, which they're not going to, especially if they come up to somebody and just go, teach me how to hack, because that's the last thing you want to do.
I think now, you know, a hacker is somebody that is uh, talented and talented with technology and passionate about it. Not just talented because they went to school and, and learned something, but talented because they, you know, when they go to bed at night, or, you know, they think about technology, or when they. You know, when they wake up in the morning, they think about technology. You know, technology makes them happy. And everything I do, eat, breathe. My wife swears I talk in numbers when I'm sleeping. Do I feel that's a lifestyle? Absolutely. Sure, it's a lifestyle. We live that. We breathe it. Um, we'll die going that way. We'll be 80 trying to tell these youngins, you don't even know what a 2600 hertz is. I don't actually know if it's something that becomes a lifestyle for anyone. I think you either have that mentality in you, the, the idea of I want to see what's happening behind the curtain, and if you're not born with it, I can't imagine where you'd get it. It starts off with curiosity, wanting to know, you know, can I do this? Um, uh, could I do this differently? Could I do this better, more efficiently? But I also like spreading knowledge. I like looking this, uh, at somebody's face and seeing the lights go on in their eyes, you know, and they go, ooh, that's how it works. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's not black art, you know, it's not magic. It's just turn this knob and hit that button. They go, oh, cool. And now they have a skill. It's sort of like uh, teaching someone to fish instead of, you know, giving them a cheeseburger. And I like teaching people how to fish. That's really cool. This is like, DEF CON is a chance to just chill the hell out, drink your beer, get really buzzed, you know, whatever you do, go to parties, hang out with these people, give hugs, love each other, you know what I mean? And appreciate what you all, we're all doing for the community and the industry in itself. And I think that's really what it's about. Tell you how I describe it to my mom, I uh, am my dad. I backed them both up and brought them to DEF CON. It's true, I spooned with his mom and DEF CON. He did spoon with my mother. And they come here and they feel like they're getting the real deal. They're meeting other people like themselves again. And it's sort of a safe haven. So if you look around at the people that you see at this con, they, the, the way they think, the way their minds work, is absolutely brilliant. I mean, in, in prodigies, the majority of them. I started going to DEF CON in 2002 and really just fell in love with a group of people that I got to interact there. It's, uh, I think, the most challenging group of individuals that I get to hang out with at any point in the year and there's just something about being around a group of people who question absolutely everything that's always really inspiring to me. Somebody told me the first year I was here that it was going downhill and the only reason to come anymore was to see all the people they knew and I thought well that sounds uphill to me. <laughs> we ended up getting about 110 people. We stayed up all night. It was you know we had only one room about a little twice the size of this room and that was it and it just grew and grew and grew from there. He's the hacker con that was able to sustain this many people in Las Vegas and keep growing and sustain itself. And that's mm. a talent, the fact that he branched into these other things to help fund it. That's his talent. Every year you're constantly trying to fix the stuff that happened the previous year. I can have more speakers, I can have contests. You kind of get addicted. <laughs> one of my first dons, I sit down at a random table and there's some guy there. I go, oh, hi, I'm Dan. He goes, oh, hi, Dan, so what do you do? And I, you know, just tell him my actual, you know, what my talk's about. And the guy gets it and he totally understands. And I'm like, where else can I go where what I'm doing is totally understood the first time and the person's as excited as I am? And that's just cool. I always, after conventions, I always get so activated and so full of ideas. Like, oh yeah, I can go out and I can do this new thing that I learned. I come home on a high that lasts me for, and I don't drink. I, um, and, but, but, I, I am 
emotionally healed, psychologically healed, and it can get me through my real life for a while. Yeah, it's just that total sense of activation and sharing energies with different people. Yeah. Intellectual stimulation, as well as various other stimulation. It's for not stimulating. And porn. And porn. It's just so intellectually stimulating, it's, as Mouse said. You come home and for like a month you're on this like intellectual high and there is nothing better than that. And this is like by far the coolest thing. I go and I talk at DEF CON, I get 50 or 60 emails, wild-eyed kids, they're like brimming with ideas and you know what, they give me great ideas. It, that's why this is so great. It's like we, we all come here we get it. and we get it and and we can and we're passionate. communicate. Yeah, we love it. Yeah. I've been coming to this convention for like 10 years now and some of these people, you know, I only get to see once a year. They're from all over the world and this is, this is the one place I can see everybody I care about and keep up on everything that's happening, all the new developments. I've always been outside the norm. So for me, this is my normal environment. I, I'm home here and I'm more comfortable among these people than and until I found the cons, I didn't realize that I hadn't, that I didn't have a family. When you see all these people that have the same mindset. passion and yeah. mindset as, as you, you know, you finally feel like you belong. It's like coming home. Right, exactly. These are stepper motors and they control the X and the Y axis of this up and down, back and forth. And I have a program I built in Java that will take images from that webcam up there and then it finds all the white spots because they're white spots on black targets. And then uh, we'll translate that into angles that this can move and then move and fire accordingly. One of the key traits you'll find among a lot of these people here at this conference is that they like problems. They like problem solving. Just take something which you're given a bunch of tools, you don't quite know how they all work, and you figure it out. They're more interested in how the computer actually, or the television, or the telephone, or, or the, the, the Xbox, or the Wii, or whatever. They're more interested in how those things work, and they're, they're curious enough to, to not just accept what is given to them. Uh, one of the things that we're really pushing right now is the hackerspace action community, trying to get people in their local communities to get together with other people in their communities, some that they know, some that they might not know, and try to build an open public benefit hackerspace where they can all get all of their computers and all of their gear and their tools and things like that out of their basements, out of their rooms, put them all in a shared commercial space, set up a cooperative arrangement where they all agree to do a certain amount of work, they all agree to pay a certain amount of the rent. Basically, we started in 2005, we got a space, got some people. That's all we really did. We said, hey, let's, let's get together and get a shop and build cool stuff and work on interesting problems and get lots of bandwidth and storage for porn and all this stuff, right? Like a collaborative workspace. Uh, there's lots of equipment and computers and uh, lots of tools and great big power tools. And, uh, People come and work on their own projects or collaborate on projects together. Do things like that and use all those tools and all those equipment to repair um, old computers, old equipment that could be used, donated to people who might not be able to afford a computer, show people who might not be able to afford net access how to get access using resources that are available in the community, show people how to use open source software to show that you don't have to pay lots of money to get big fancy software programs when free software that does the exact same thing is out there and is actively developed. Um, and to try to bring in people from the community who, you know, might Love, might really love this community that might be scared by the whole hacker element of it. You can stand in the middle of a room and not just say, hey, can I borrow a soldering iron? It's, hey, who wants to just come and solder this wicked, crazy project with me? And half the people, you know, say, oh, that sounds neat. And a couple people just stand up and say, sure, I'll do it. And you'll end up going home with a friend you met out of the blue <laughs> who's going to, you know, just, that's, we met so yeah. randomly. Hey, brother, I will go with you anywhere, anytime to do pretty much anything, but I am not staying in the same room as you again. God, God you snore. snore. Almost without fail, any hacking collective group of friends that all happen to meet at the same place at the same time without a permit, toxic barbecue, get a permit next year. 
they freely accept anybody because it's about sharing information. It's not about hiding shit from people. And I don't want people to become so complacent that they just are like mindless consumers. You know, I think you need to be able to tear things apart and understand what's really going on. People are motivated to get everything prefab. Uh, not too many people make things on their own. And part of making things is learning how things work, whether that's software or whatever. whatever. way to, to get America to understand this is to teach our children technology, to give them things that they can take apart and break and learn and say, what happens if I poke the A in B? Um, what happens if I if I roll this over, if I build it this way? Just, just give our kids a chance to learn how to do things themselves. Yes. And Don't punish inquisitiveness. Exactly. And I think parents actually, if their kids want to be a hacker, that they should just encourage them to experiment and play and definitely take things apart, see how they work, make them into new things. You've got to send them to, I don't know, science camp and you know, encourage them to break things. Right? Keep promoting it, supporting it. Let, let them go to the hacking club at school. You know, let them do those things and get behind them because it really will pay off in the future. And like we say at the school, it's go geek, not Greek. <laughs> I probably broke more lawnmowers and outboard engines and, you know, taking them apart and they kind of almost worked when I put them together, you know? I knew how it worked, I just couldn't quite get it to do it again. It was one of the proudest days of my life when my 11 years old son took apart his PlayStation 2 to see what was inside of it. His, his, his mom, you know, it wanted to beat his ass. Me, I went out and bought him another one. It, okay, don't take this one apart, but let me show you what this one's made off of. Having children, yes, we have kids too, but ours are smarter. So my children are like total hackers, and, and they're only five and four. But like, they, they, my son has broken my Blackberry freaking password twice, and I don't know how he does it, but it's like he's intuitive that way, you know? Well, hacking starts as a kid. You're given Lincoln yep. Logs, you're given Legos, you're given all these things to create and take apart and put together, but at a certain point, it's replaced. You know, Legos get to a point where your parents tell you you're too old for these. Mm -hmm. Even though you're Girls especially. Oh, yeah. We discourage our girls from exploring. They're, the toys you give them are pink vacuum cleaners, dolls, and things to, to make them attractive to boyfriends at some day. Whatever reason, there aren't that many girls that are into science or technology or whatever the case may be. And also, I think that uh, popular culture is less able to accept the stereotype of socially inept geek applied to a woman. You know, it's the same problem, I think, why aren't there more women in engineering or uh, you know, in medicine, women are also underrepresented a lot. Some of the hard sciences. Uh, you know, the statistics in, in education are that a lot of women do enter, or are more women are entering this field, but they tend to drop out as they progress. Why do they drop out? Well, maybe it's not it's not conducive to the society that they were brought up in. They don't they don't think it that way because they were brought up to not think in that way. Maybe it's because it's an unwelcome environment, but it is what it is. You know, I mean, nobody developed it to be this way. It just is and computer security is not only not really a recognized career path yet, you know, for women. Let me ask you this, why should there be more women in this industry? Porn. I mean, it's porn. Do you think that there is an uneven balance? Do you think that it's not supposed to be like this? Because I get that from a lot of people when they talk about women in this industry, that there should be more women in this industry, and why? Should there be, or are there more women in mechanics? The females in this industry that I've worked with have had some of the most unique and interesting perspectives of anyone that I've actually been with. It's the point where it's like, you know what? There are incompetent people of both genders. And uh, if you actually find someone competent, gender's the last thing on your mind. The good thing though is, as a woman, everybody will talk to you. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. They'll be happy to buy you drinks. They're just excited that like, hey, women are interested in this stuff? Cool. You know, it's not just a total guy geeky thing. Because, you know, a lot of girls will kind of stereotype that. Oh God, it's like, he's a nerd, he's a geek, he's like doing this. 
but then you meet people like some girl that'll be like doing C++ and you're like, what a relief. They're, they're pretty cool guys for the most part and they're really generally happy to have girls around. Just because a lot of people see me as, oh, she's cute and she's uh, at this conference and yeah, I'm gonna go hit on her. She must be, uh, you know, one of the fun girls. But I mean, every once in a while I find someone cool that I can actually talk to and doesn't seem like they're gonna try to get in my pants. It, there's kind of like there's there's two camps either like they run away or they like they completely are totally forward. See, I have a hit on you. I don't know. You're close last night. I came here just to see you. Well, you called me out. Of course, you get a couple of idiots who automatically see a, a cute girl and think that she must be a scene whore, but they normally get put in their place real fast by a couple of goons who are you know willing to say, "Ma'am, what I can do to you ain't half of what that girl's gonna do if she has to get a hold of you because you won't shut up." I don't know a whole lot of girls that come to these types of things, so I haven't noticed if they've been treated differently or not. <laughs> there are no lines at the bathrooms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been going to this for like six years and it's changed over the years. It used to be people just assume I was a scene whore or something, and then as years went on, I got to know more people and that faded less. And there were a couple of years that were pretty rough for the only girls that you saw. There was uh, lots of talk about scene horrors and, and there, there were some ugly years. I found that as long as you're not too easily offended and fairly easy going, um, you, you can fit right in, you know? You just kind of have to develop a sense of humor and a fairly thick skin and, you know, be able to dish it out as well as you can take it. And... Well, honestly, I don't, I, I think you've got to be really thick skinned to hang out with this, this crowd. Especially well, us. Especially this crowd. We stab. Um, a lot of, well, we play stab tag, we break arms, we punch Canadians. This is what makes us us. They're bad, they're evil, they can whistle launch codes, and they will blow up your computer. How does the media portray anything? It just portrays it by soundbite. And our media influence and so forth. Hackers are all bad guys hiding in their parents' basement, slaving away in front of a monitor at two in the morning with large stacks of Joe Cola sitting there. I don't think that that's the rule that we're all secluded in our, in our dungeons, typing away frantically, you know, trying to take over the world. I mean, I am, but... <laughs> the public opinion of the hacking community is that hackers are stealing their credit cards, that they're breaking into their personal files. They think they're spreading viruses and breaking things down and, and generally spreading chaos, and that's just not the case at all. Yeah, Hollywood portrays hackers in a bad light most of the time, and I think that's wrong, because most of the hackers that I know are, are damn good people who are just trying to break things to make them work better. People started using computers to commit crimes, and instead of just calling them a computer criminal, we decided to, uh, or the media decided, to appropriate the name hacker and apply it. We already had a meaning for the word hacker. It was a good thing, it was a compliment, you know? And, and no matter what we say, no matter what we do, you know, the average user or the average, you know, they're gonna see it that way. That's what they see on TV, and they believe what they see on TV. Hollywood takes a prostitute walking the streets in uh, Hollywood and has her meet Richard Gere, and yeah, it's all fiction. Some movies are actually fairly accurate at hacking. Some of them are not. I haven't seen Angelina Jolie here yet. The movie Sneakers, where they're showing the, the line trace, you know, hopping from continent to continent, from satellite to satellite. I thought that was the most hilarious thing. I mean, Die Hard was a little bit of a stretch, you know, but Die Hard 4 or whatever. So I went and saw it and I said, yeah, that, 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 was, that was really a light telling of what was possible. I was, I was kind of disappointed that they really downplayed what could be done the way they did. Yeah, there's a lot of credibility there. They did a pretty good job of bringing to light uh, some vulnerabilities that are not well understood but could cause problems should somebody figure out how exactly to break into it. I think the best thing that happened uh, in, uh, in that movie as far as uh, making people aware of things was the uh, the social hack that uh, uh, the uh, the kid did with calling on start and said his dad was dying and, and please start the car. So that's 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 the first the first time I've ever seen a really well demonstrated uh, example of social engineering. Hackers the movie it kind of borders on 
both. Um, there's some accuracy to that. A lot of it is, you know, computer-generated graphics that makes hacking look like flying through a, you know, digital landscape. Uh, it's definitely not like that, but I think the one thing that stood out from that movie, and I'm gonna get crucified for saying this, and everybody gives me crap, but I actually, I think they got one thing right in that movie. I think they got the fact that the, the, even the characters, while they were way over the top, were generally good people who and just were, you know, they were passionate about technology and they didn't really want to hurt anybody. They're, they were just kind of pranksters and like they're the best, you know, they had good intentions. And uh, I think that's what that, that particular aspect of a very over the top dramatic interpretation was pretty right on. I mean, like, I think almost everybody in this build, I think almost everybody at DEF CON has great, good intentions. Like, I don't want to break in anybody's computers. I'm not 12 years old anymore. DEF CON, this conference, and all these gatherings, the films, they're the petri dish, and the people have to live in them. There's really not a lot of connection between the environment that hackers work in and what the people themselves are doing or who they are. And uh, it's, it's hard to see that difference when all you get is this sort of interpreted medium of storytelling. Because storytelling is fundamentally good for teaching lessons, but it's not really very good for understanding the people. It never really was, and uh, nobody does a character study in Hackers because they're kind of boring. It's been an old DEF CON tradition um, to have a, a dunk tank with uh, water pouring on the great and the good of hackers um, and, um, and the guys very nicely donate the money to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The Electronic Frontier Foundation started about 16 years ago now, uh, at the very early beginnings of um, when the net was turning up for the first time and really law enforcement and judges really didn't know what to do with a lot of the, um, the things that were happening on there. Um, the EFF is basically the uh, online equivalent of the ACLU. When you're some guy that maybe works at Microsoft or some guy that sits in a cubicle all day, but you're also on the outside at home breaking the boundaries and changing things, you don't have much protection from if the government says, no, you can't do that, or a corporation says, no, you can't do that, we're going to send you, we're going to sue you. Yeah, the, um, the DMCA is kind of creepy because it has, it prevents you from reverse engineering certain things. And as a security guy, that's all you do is try to figure out how things work, you take them apart. Now there's a, there's a, an, a provision, an acceptable uh, safe harbor for reverse engineering, but it's never been tested. So it's never gone to court. Nobody knows what it really means. So 10 different people read it and have 10 different opinions. And since it's never been adjudicated, nobody really knows. So companies, take a very narrow view if it's their product and threaten to sue you. Researchers take a very broad view and research stuff. And until we kind of get, you know, a bright line of the law, it's, it's kind of, uh, the uncertainty uh, scares people. The people on the hill that actually make the laws, you know, they're like five generations past me and they don't understand technology. The people, the people making the laws do not understand the technology behind it. Yeah, I, the people here that understand the technology don't, they're not law people, the people that understand the law don't know the technology. There's always going to be a, a disconnect there, and I, I, I think some of the maybe the unfair prosecution that's occurred might be part of what contributes to this ooh, evil image out there. What we have for, yeah, well, what, what we have for like computer unauthorized access is a two-page law called Title 18 U.S.C. 1030. And it's a two pages and it's vague as hell. Because not a whole lot of laws exist. So it's basically, you know, one day I could be doing something that, you know, is completely within the lines. And because one company gets pissed off, all of a sudden it becomes illegal. And when you push the envelope in any field, and that's what we do, they get uncomfortable and you're changing laws, okay? They essentially help open the eyes of the people who are unaware of their vulnerability. Because they find exploits, they write tools to break something, and then they go to the creators and tell them, look, here's what they did, here's how to, how to fix it. And these guys come in and say, look, you know, they say the emperor has no clothes. And, um, and sometimes they get shut down for that. A good example of this is electronic voting. Um, a bunch of people took a look at electronic voting systems and said, you know, these are full of flaws. These are worse than, than having, you know, loose chats. These could be not only a broken broken into by somebody trying to win an election, but they could be broken into remotely, they could be controlled with absolutely no trace, and the uh, companies that are selling these e-voting machines are making absolutely no effort to fix that. That's where the 
hacker community comes in. They're they're addressing those. They're addressing where you know the industry as well as you know your government is falling short on protecting you in you know basically a digital age. One of the best things you can do to understand something is learn how it works and learn how to make it do things that it's not supposed to do. The first question that came to me, in my mind, and for some of my friends, is aren't you going to create more bad guys by teaching hacking in college? And my preconceived notion, which has been borne out by experience, is that as far as I can tell, the criminals do not go to college to learn how to do this. The criminals already know how to do this. You're sharing the information to the uninformed consumer so that they have the, the, the will of the mighty dollar to force the manufacturers who are profiting off of those substandard products to improve them and actually make you safe instead of just making you feel safe. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about where the line is and uh, looking at the line and saying, there's the line. We want to be on one side of it, not necessarily the other. So we kind of bring some of that more holistic view of hacking is okay but hacking for the wrong causes is not. I think people who come to this conference have probably no clue how afraid academics are. They are so afraid that you are these evil supervillains going to destroy the world and they're going to corrupt the morals of our students. They do not understand that this is something that is exciting and, and happy and these people are enjoying their life. They think of them as some twisted freaks that are trapped by some hideous emotional deformity to be unable to socialize. And so when you can look at somebody that has, you know, a hacker black t-shirt on, sunglasses, and, you know, a bunch of piercings, and, you know, blue hair, and say, that's, that's, that's crazy, that's not normal, that's, you know, that's, that must be a bad guy. Uh, I haven't committed a crime in years, but I have freaky hair and black clothes. I do also have a do daughter and a stable job, and mm -hmm. career and education. Pay your taxes, you probably drive the speed limit when you can. You Most know. of the time, yeah. Yeah. These, these are normal people. They might dress differently, they might look differently, they might drop an F-bomb a little more often than some other people or whatever, but they hang out together, they drink beer together, they're interested in things other than computers. They are not just, you know, geeks all the time. I want people to understand that geeks, hackers, whatever, they're everyday people. They're no different than anyone else. There's no magic, there's no hung up. Bastard, bastard. It's more like white blood cells. They're a little different than the rest of the blood, but they kind of a necessary function. It's the immune system for society. Uh, any group that's passionate about something, I think, would be analogous. It's just in our case, it just happens to be computers. There's not like these like furry little helpless animals, and like you wanna you wanna be nice to them and like pet them and stuff. You don't wanna like throw them in jail and be mean to them because yeah, they say offensive things and they've got lots of piercings, but uh, in the end, <laughs> I I can see why they're they're doing what they're doing. And, just accept people. Let yeah. people be who they yeah. want to be, and if it's not actually hurting you, ignore it. Have you noticed that nobody cares what you look like here? I, I don't think that everybody has to get along with hackers or think that people are good for doing it, but somebody's got to do it. What you have to do is throw away the stigma of hackers and that they're out to get you because we're not the enemy. Hackers are people, right? They really are, you know, they mow lawns. Hackers are people too. No, let, let me not say that in the PSA type question. What's a hacker documentary? You know, it's a guy doing his laundry. Because that's what a hacker is. A hacker doesn't spend 24-7, you know, being some shadowy figure in the dark. He mows his lawn, he takes out his trash, he goes to work. He doesn't shower very often. I will throw that out. Here's the PSA. Hackers are people too. I'm a strong curls, and the more you know. Hackers are people too. They're just people with, with an IQ that's like, a good 20% higher than the average normal, so they get bored really easy. So they have a tendency to, to pull pranks and try to find ways to make life more interesting. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's nothing illegal about that. You know, hackers are people too. Just because we're smart and we push technology where it wasn't. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> hackers are people too? Well, certainly we're people. Are they really? Hackers are people too. Oh. <laughs> We're good peeps, yo. Give a hacker a hug. Hug your hacker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't be scared. We're warm and fuzzy. We're good people. Just give us a hug. <laughs>
separating Oreos into cream and non-cream entities so that I can gain like 20 fucking points in the scavenger hunt. God, sniff your packets. Because apparently they crave just the cream. All right, I need an out loud countdown. Here we go. One, two. And the cab driver's like, what, what's going on over there? You know, I saw a guy with a uh, I fuck sheep shirt on. What, 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 what is that about? What's going on over there? Is the answer Margaret Thatcher, the color green, and Wisconsin? And it's so Damn! You can call me anything you want, just not late for dinner. I don't have a name. They didn't give me one. Packers are broke. <laughs> I carry like not. Yeah. Abandoned at birth for this. Bavarian eatery. He's his mom. It is my mom. Hello, mom. You won't have a death time. They just call me Strudel. <laughs> my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. You're about to die. <laughs> you know, my, my kids aren't my kids aren't 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 old enough to run a port scanner yet. I am a bad hacker. Hey, oh, does this have a John and Yoko home feel? I don't know, like in bed. Hey, you know, I didn't even think of that. It's our love Yeah, a little hacker look. That's us, yeah. Higher into the left, higher into the left. Oh, I'm a, I'm a girl, I like to shop. I like shoes. I like, you know. I joke about religion. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there are two kinds of technology. There's stuff that can kill you, and other. like this, it's just a bunch of sweaty nerds. So one of my neighbors gets locked out of her apartment. And I see her in the lobby. I'm like, oh, hi, what's going on? She's like, not much, I'm locked out. I'm waiting for, you know, the locksmith to come. And I'm like, oh, hang on, let me go grab my lockpick. And she looks at me like I just grew horns. I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. I'm a hacker. And she goes, oh, okay. What? Legal or illegal, it does not change what is right and what is wrong. Wrong.